Hello there, friends. Welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. Today's episode will have some spoilers in it from Ahsoka Part 6. Now, as Star Wars fans, we always see the Empire's, how shall I say it, ruthlessly clean. You know, gleaming white plastoid armor, sterile and cold looking Imperial class Star Destroyers, gray on the outside, more white on the inside. There's no decoration, no personality, no sign that there are humans inside all of that armor. There's almost an obsession to how clean everything looks. And so seeing Thrawn's Chimera approach over the horizon, looking like an old Chevy Impala with missing hubcaps and the wrong color replacement body panels all over it was definitely surprising. I thought to myself, oh my God, the Jawas get a run of the place. They're like the organic buzz droids of the Star Wars galaxy. Terrifying. And if the Chimera's appearance surprises you, wait till you see these crazy looking stormtroopers inside of the hold. The second you get close enough, you realize that they two are in a really shoddy state. I mean, some of these guys have replacement panels on their helmets and their armor. These are unpainted panels because, you know, you didn't want to fork over 300 extra credits to get it painted factory white. I mean, some of these stormtroopers even have cracks in their plastoid, which reveals a golden or metallic sheen underneath. And of course, you have those Nightsister ribbons wrapped all across their armor. I believe this is more than just decoration. It might even be witchcraft. But yeah, this is this is really cool. You know, in the Aftermath novels, we learned about what happened to the Empire once the Emperor is dead and the logistical chain breaks apart. And Thrawn's troopers here look a lot like how I imagined the stormtroopers garrisoned on Jakku would have looked. They were just basically waiting around for the final battle to occur. There's a complete breakdown in discipline by this point in time. And, um, you know, the Imperial Army had more or less just faded away already. It was only really these fanatic stormtrooper legions that were still hanging around. But even then, being quartered on a desert planet with only ship-based rations and facilities meant that the stormtroopers' armor started degrading. The sand started scruffing the surfaces of their armor. That strict cleaning regulation that existed while they were stationed on board ships and bases more or less disappeared. Some of these stormtroopers actually go tribal. They start painting their helmets with war paint. They start adding memorabilia and little trinkets onto their armor. This would have been completely against regulations back in the day. And as discipline continues to slide, you know, the strong begin to tower over the weak and bully them. Things just are slowly falling apart. They look less like the Empire's military and more like a war band. The situation becomes very apocalypse now, you know, into the heart of darkness. And that is the vibe I'm getting from these stormtroopers. Excuse me, they're actually called night troopers. And this is a pretty big deal. This is what really separates them from the Jakku Imperial Remnant. Yes, they might look similar, but I think there's something a little bit more sinister going on here in Peridia. Before we continue, a quick word from our sponsor for today's video, Onusaber.com. They have some of the most realistic and high quality lightsabers on the market. And right now when you purchase a lightsaber, you can get a free scabbard with your purchase for free. Simply add both the scabbard and the lightsaber to the cart and use the code TECH, T-E-C-K, all caps, at checkout. Onusaber.com also has a super sale category where two sabers from each one of their collections are given a huge discount. These sabers are unfortunately not involved in the free scabbard special. Also, the Dark Saber does not fit into the scabbard I tried. This special ends on September 24th, so take advantage of it now. Check out the description down below for more information, and don't forget to use our promo code EWOK for an additional $15 off of your purchase. Thank you for your patience. On to the rest of the video. The nomenclature Night Trooper clearly refers to the Death Miri. They like to call themselves Night Sisters and Night Brothers, and so these guys are the Night Troopers. These Night Troopers are wrapped up in red ribbon, which clearly means that they are wrapped up in Death Mary magic. And this kind of makes sense. Thrawn was spirited away to this planet of Peridia, homeworld of the Death Mary, and he's this very analytical individual who's really good at first contact situations. Thrawn loves studying new cultures and art. This gives him a better understanding of how a new group he encounters will act, and whether they're going to threaten him or be a potential ally. I honestly get the vibe that Thrawn might be on the spectrum, but since he's a genius, he's shored up his social abilities by turning the art of understanding other people into almost a science. He's a fascinating character, and more importantly, he's not a very emotionally driven individual. And so when he lands on this planet of Peridia, with his fleet completely destroyed, aside from the Chimera, as far as we can see, he needs to figure out how to keep himself and his troops alive, or at least, you know, active and going. I don't know, alive qualifies here. 
You know, Ultron used to care a lot about his subordinates and make sure that they were all taken care of and constantly being challenged in order to promote growth. Now, Thrawn back in those days was in a much more relaxed situation. When he served the Empire, it was, it was before the Battle of Yavin had even happened. So the Empire was still intact. There were plenty of resources, plenty of time for Thrawn to train his men properly. But getting yeeted to another galaxy with no hope of coming back, well, that changes a person and makes them more desperate. And Thrawn, being the rational individual that he is, was pragmatic here. He looked at the Death Mary Knight sisters and saw them as a very valuable ally on this wasteland of a planet. And I have to give him credit for this. In all honesty, I would have screamed witch and then ordered my weapons officer to open fire on them the second I saw them. They're absolutely terrifying. I mean, you don't wear red in an environment this stark unless you're a complete badass and capable of f***ing up everything in the surrounding area. But what is interesting is these witches actually seem to respect Thrawn back. Mothers, I salute you. I mean, typically, mystics and hyper-rational military types don't really get along well together, but they do have a common goal. You see, both Thrawn and the Night Sisters seem to want to leave Peridia desperately. We don't exactly know why the Night Sisters want to leave, this being their home planet. We'll speculate about that more in later videos. But anyway, Thrawn cuts a deal with them. Soon we shall all escape this exile thanks to the efforts of Morgan and Elspeth. This is Enoch, captain of my guard. He shall begin the cargo transfer as per my agreement with the Great Mothers. I have seen the catacombs. It will take some time. So the Night Sisters are having Thrawn basically empty out their catacomb. A catacomb is an underground cemetery. And Thrawn is having his captain Enoch, named after the biblical patriarch of the same name, bring all of these, I'm guessing, corpses onto his ship. The Dothmeri are known for their dark magic. They have the ability to reanimate corpses, fortify an individual's size and strength with magical ichor. They can even create legs out of thin air, as Mother Talzin did for Maul. I, I believe that the dark magic the Night Sisters are using here is somehow related to Sith alchemy. This is an ancient force technique that was lost in the various Jedi versus Sith wars that have basically destroyed all of the force knowledge in the galaxy in the last few thousand years. Darth Sidious and Darth Plagueis really try to revive Sith alchemy, and, and Sidious actually tries to partner with Mother Talzin early on in his role in order to learn more of her secrets, but he does betray her, and that partnership kind of ends. But yeah, the Night Sisters are pretty powerful. They have a different way of manipulating the Force, something that's lost in the, um, I guess you could call it the Star Wars galaxy, because this is another galaxy. And it seems like in isolation on Peridia, these great mothers have managed to keep this tradition of Sith alchemy alive. And I believe what we're seeing here with these night troopers is heavily related to their dark magic. Magic that Thrawn has no fear of, because again, he's this practical individual. He just wants to survive. Great mothers, I shall once again require the aid of your dark magic. The thread of destiny demands it, Grand Admiral. Now, based just on the appearances of these uh, night troopers with their cracks in their helmet, all the dirt and grime on their bodies, a lot of people have said that they kind of remind them of death troopers. If you guys have never read Death Troopers, let me just say it's not only a great Star Wars zombie novel, it's just a great zombie novel, period. This book is usually in my top five when people are asking me for uh, recommendations of Star Wars reads. Uh, this novel is basically self-contained, so you don't have to read anything else. It's just a really great story. I like it a lot. But that was a zombie epidemic created by a virus, a force virus of sorts. And I actually don't think that's what we're seeing here. I listened to the voices of these night troopers once again, and they kind of sounds a lot like Merrick, the uh, Inquisitor who kind of explodes into a dust cloud. They kind of sound more like the uruk here than just a legion of dead. And the movement of these night troopers isn't very stiff or eerie like you would expect from a zombie trooper. I mean, look at these undead Darth Mary zombies. They just don't act or move in the same way. These troopers seem more calm and disciplined. They seem to move in very natural and fluid ways. If Thrawn is using an undead army, I think that's what's hidden inside of the catacombs. You know, generations and generations of Night Sisters buried perfectly just waiting to be revived. I also kind of hate this idea that Thrawn would actually use black magic to turn all of his troopers into undead minions. 
I mean, clearly a lot of stormtroopers survived the transit to Peridia, or at least I think they did. I mean, the windows were breached in some areas, but this is a large, large ship. And more importantly, if Thrawn has to convert a few stormtroopers into the undead, I'm sure the other stormtroopers would get really pissed off and he would have to basically make them all zombies. It's either all of them or none of them. A part of me wants to really think that these stormtroopers are just decorating. You know, they're embracing the local culture. They like the red ribbons. But we all know that Thrawn's stormtroopers are supposed to be highly trained and very disciplined. Not in an irrational way, but like, you know, they're supposed to keep their uniforms clean at least. It's all a part of this image, this, this routine that soldiers have to keep up in order to be always prepared. It's just kind of confusing seeing Thrawn commanding such a rabble. It's not that Thrawn would refuse to lead a unit because of such superficial reasons, but the stormtrooper's appearance is supposed to reflect their commander's clarity of mind and, and his, you know, just professionalism. In my opinion, there has to be a reason why these stormtroopers look like this, why they're so dirty. And so again, the other side of the argument here that the night troopers are in fact creatures of the night awoken from their eternal sleep is getting stronger. You know, what Thrawn does encounter on this planet is a shortage of hypermatter fuel, a shortage of proton torpedoes, and more importantly, a shortage of food and water. A Star Destroyer usually has tens of thousands of crew on board, including a legion of stormtroopers. The average ISD is like a small city and they have warehouses full of provisions, but those provisions usually only last two years, according to the brochures. A Thrawn ship has been stuck on this planet for 10, 11 years now, and so they must have ran out of their provisions. And there doesn't seem to be that much food on the surface either. Also, the fact that we don't see any unhelmeted personnel, you know, like Imperial Navy officers or troopers, it's kind of troubling. These Star Destroyers should have far more Navy crew than Stormtroopers. They usually outnumber them three to one. And the fact that his right-hand man is no longer a naval aide or a captain is a troubling sign. The Imperial Navy has always been at odds with the Stormtrooper Corps. We've done videos about this, but basically the Stormtrooper Corps is a little bit more basic in how they think. They're about ground pounding, kicking down doors, which is useful, but the Imperial Navy, they're recruited from the smarter segments of society who have to make it through the Imperial Academy, score very high, and then make it to flight school. So they're naturally gonna be more independent-minded and gonna resist things like, I don't know, being turned into undead zombies. I feel like the fact that Thrawn has a stormtrooper captain, right? He's always had Imperial Navy attaches and you know officers by his side to help him. Uh, but, but a stormtrooper second in command means Thrawn has probably become a little more fanatic, a little more reliant on heavy handed measures. It's possible that the stormtroopers and the navy troopers had a fight on board. I don't know, just some theories here. And so now all you have left is Enoch, the shepherd of all these dead bodies. And what's with the gold mask, you ask? Well, that's always been a part of Thrawn's motif. He's always had gold decorating his stuff, and gold is the color of wisdom, elegance, and divinity. It's also one of the densest materials in the world. It's very durable, it's an excellent conductor of energy, and it doesn't rust. It really does stand out on all of that dirty white plastoid armor. Gold is also commonly used in alchemy and witchcraft because of its amazing properties. And what's even more interesting is Enoch, with his golden mask, is replicating an old Roman tradition, the funerary mask. You know, Romans weren't a very culturally rich people originally. They were warriors, a soldiering culture. They were really good at logistics and fighting and organizing their military. And really a lot of their culture and art comes from absorbing other cultures that have arts. But the funerary mask has always been a deeply rooted Roman thing. I guess as soldiers, they've always been obsessed with death. And so these masks are designed to be a legacy, a monument to the person whose likeness it's made out of. As a matter of fact, it wasn't uncommon for entire families to wear masks of the deceased to show their importance. It should be noted that some elite Roman cavalry units did have golden masks as well as a part of their attire. It was usually used for more dangerous training. It was a sign of strength also on the battlefield, but again, it was rare for soldiers to actually wear this into battle because it really limits your field of view. But yeah, I still think this is a funerary mask on Enoch, which kind of is another point for this undead army theory. Grand Admiral. The mercenaries have departed. For a moment, my wing and wait for my signal. As you wish. He does sound like Merrick a lot when he talks, and Merrick wasn't really that solid of a character when Ahsoka penetrated his suit. And so maybe we're looking at a similar application of magic here. Maybe the bodies are gone inside of these stormtrooper outfits, 
And now the Night Sisters have used their ancient magic to animate these suits using the plastoid and rubber insulation suits as a seal for the spirits. And the red ribbons that are wrapped around it on the outside are sort of like a charm or a ribbon that keeps the spirits tethered inside. The gold plate and the metal might be another type of totem that keeps these spirits inside of the Stormtrooper uniforms. Remember we talked about this holy and divine meaning behind gold? It should also be noted that Enoch doesn't have any red ribbons on him, which makes him a bit different from the other troopers. It might indicate that he's not under the spell of the Great Mothers, which is why Thrawn has him as a second in command. But then again, uh, you know, Enoch says the following to Sabine Wren when she leaves. Die well. It's almost a little too on the nose. Maybe Thrawn's people ran out of food. Maybe a lot of these stormtroopers died on the ship when the Purgle started damaging the ship and venting compartments into space. Maybe, as I mentioned before, the stormtroopers and the naval troopers had a mutiny and started fighting against each other. Stormtrooper helmets don't just crack in half like that unless blunt force is applied to the plastoid. Now, there could be a third option, which is kind of like Night Sister Magic Light, which is where they uh, use their magical ichor to imbue these stormtroopers with supernatural powers, whatever those might be. Just like how Mother Talza made Savajo press far stronger and more powerful than he actually was with the magical liquor. This is kind of a nice half measure. It would still explain all those red ribbons wrapped around the troopers. And maybe the metal that's on their armor is just an attempt to repair these things with local materials. I mean, creating plastoid is probably really difficult if you don't have the right tools and uh, materials, which they definitely don't have. But if you use old blacksmithing technology, you can work gold or iron into something usable. Whatever it is, there is something clearly wrong with this planet, a decay or sense of dread that the Force users particularly feel. You know, after talking through everything, I'm starting to believe in this whole theory that this indeed is a spirit army or an army of the undead. I mean, we really won't be able to tell until Ahsoka or Sabine or Ezra starts whacking these stormtroopers in the head and like, you know, dust comes out of them or something. I wonder if you get sick if you inhale that green dust. It cannot be good for you. Anyway, I do want to end this video by talking about Thrawn. I think we're seeing a character who's holding it together quite well on the surface. But if you read the canon novels of this character, you'll know that he's fallen really a long way from what he used to be, a more you know, bright-eyed individual who really wanted peace and stability for the galaxy, who kind of joined up with the wrong side, in my opinion. And now he's basically really committed to this imperial lie of strength, uh, peace through strength, you know? The order and stability that the Empire promised to bring to the galaxy was always an illusion. It's clear that the Old Republic, even the New Republic, was far more efficient in spreading resources and improving the lives of the people living underneath its rule. If anything, Palpatine's policies, Thrawn's own actions, caused more chaos than peace. And so Thrawn being where he is in life is probably now not above using whatever means necessary to not only survive, but get his revenge. In the past, in Legends, he wasn't above using the Spartite clone cylinders to create an army. He wasn't, um, he might not have understood what the Force was, but he wasn't above using the Force to his advantage. And so seeing Grand Admiral Thrawn at the head of an army of undead Dothmari night troopers is just not the wildest thing in the world. Well, guys, let me know in the comments section below which you think, as always. I look forward to these discussions. Um, also, don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below because we have a lot to talk about from episode six of the Ahsoka series. Stay tuned.